You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisentraff on WCPT 820. Okay, it's my great pleasure to be joined again by Holly McCall. She's the editor-in-chief of the Tennessee Lookout. She is, you know, an expert in Tennessee uh, media and politics. I think she's got a viewpoint about the whole country's media and politics. Mm. She's exactly what a great journalist should be, you know, unafraid, skeptical, but not cynical. And as I learned the last time we spoke, not unmindful that there are better angels out there if we would only listen. Hi, Holly. Welcome back. Well, Edwin, it is so good to be with you today. It is so good to be with you today. Um, I don't know about you, but in my city of Chicago, there are college uh, grads and their families everywhere as and we have a lot of higher ed and a lot of graduations going on. So it's a beautiful sight. Well, you know, um, June 1st was started Pride Month, so we are actually having a number of Pride events in Tennessee today. And there's a little bit of cel- extra celebration because, as you may know, just last night, a federal judge uh, struck down a new Tennessee law that prohibits drag shows in any public place, basically, by saying it's unconstitutional. Yeah, I saw that, and I was thrilled. Um I, you know, despite what's going on in our nation's highest court, which I uh, I find increasingly uh, injudicious, the judiciary mm-hmm. overall seems to be holding. I mean, it held through all of the litigation over the last election, time and again, saying, yep, lies are lies and facts are facts. And um, it held just now, last night, in this wonderful decision on drag shows, but it just puts the legislators who keep trying to pass cruel laws that our constitution doesn't countenance. It just makes them look, um, uh, uh, I don't know what it makes them look like. Certainly contemptuous idiotic. of the rule of law. <laughs> yeah. That idiotic. Foolish. Wasteful. Honestly, the, the Tennessee supermajority Republican legislature in the last year in particular has become the best thing that's ever happened to progressive Tennesseans. Because they keep passing laws that are struck down in federal court as unconstitutional. Uh, of course, I'm trying to remember the last time we talked, and whether it was before or after the um, two young black lawmakers were expelled from the legislature, which brought yeah, it was just after. national heartbreaking. Okay, well, you yeah. know that brought national attention that has not abated yet. And so, honestly, I know that many Democrats sent uh, notes of th- thank you notes to House Speaker Cameron Sexton literally thanking him for all he has done for Tennessee Democrats. Yeah, well, he's done it for Democrats all over the country. You know, I mean, there's a, I think back on on Bloody Sunday, on the, on the march in Selma when I was mm-hmm. younger, much mm-hmm. younger. If there are moments that the whole country looks at and goes, they've gone too far. They've gone too far. It's not okay. And, and what well, happened you know- in your state is one of those. Yeah, and it's not even, you know, you, you mentioned that I know a lot about Tennessee politics, which is true because I started working on my first campaign in Tennessee was when I was 13 and I was like a baby volunteer. But, uh, but I also, you know, my news outlet is part of an organization that has 34, 35 news outlets across the country. So I see that there are similar actions taking place in other states. We, we are not. We're not existing in a vacuum. You know, just after Tennessee expelled Justin Pearson and Justin Jones, two 27-year-old black lawmakers, you know, we saw out in Montana where they made, um, gosh, what's the transgender lawmaker, Zoe Zephyr, they booted right. her out and made her sit in the hallway. And if that wasn't enough, then, like, anti-transgender people came and sat in the spot where she was trying to work so she couldn't even work in the hallway. So, I mean, there, there are issues like this all across the country. Um, and there, are, there, are other and- there are other legislatures passing laws that I think will go down as unconstitutional. But I have to tell you, you know, we in Tennessee like to say we are the tip of the spear for stupid and unconstitutional legislation. Um, I wish that were true, but you have a lot of competition around the country. <laughs> you have a, lot, well, a lot of competition. Please don't shoot down our, our moment of um, infamy <laughs> and pride. I mean, Florida. Wow. (laughs) It's going to be tough to be worse. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, our governor, Bill Lee, um, 
you know, I, I'd say he's an interesting character, except he's not actually all that interesting. But we were the first state, Tennessee was the first state, <laughs> to have a, a law uh, banning drag shows. And he's hmm. very slow to sign a great deal of legislation, even though there was a law passed that would enable – that's a whole other topic that would like harden security around schools. He sat on that for a week, but I'm telling you what, Edward, as soon as that drag law passed, he signed it within an hour. And I think mm. he just wanted to say that Tennessee was the first state in the country to pass a drag ban. So now that this has been overturned, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in other states. And, you know, I'd be shocked with this precedent if it doesn't get flipped in, in other states as well. Yeah, I'm right. I mean, how it, it seems so contrary to what at least has been the uh, historical reading of the First Amendment f- for as long as, uh, you know, I can, uh, forever, really. I can't imagine they could read it another way. Well, you know, the, the thing is, most of these legislators, I would say most, they don't, they don't really, care. most of the Tennessee legislators, particularly on the right side, the Republican side, the only amendment they seem to care about these days is the Second Amendment. Um, and they like to talk about freedom and lack of government interference, and yet all they do is impinge upon their constituents' freedoms. Uh, they're constantly stepping in. I spent a lovely morning with my coffee and the judge's ruling, the judge's 70-page ruling, and read it all. And he just eviscerated them. Um, you know, said it violates the separation of um, the uh, principle of separation of state. Uh, not separation. Uh, what is the what is the phrase I'm looking for, Edwin? Help a middle aged woman out. No, I'm but, you older know, like than you, but I between the you, you know what I, I, I like church and state. You know what I'm, you know, no, it wasn't church and state. Any separation of powers. That's it. Thank you. Such oh. a simple word for such a middle aged COVID brained woman. But anyway, you're doing fine. He, um, <laughs> he called it out on that. He also talked about the fact that. You know, their whole argument was, well, like, this is to protect children, except in their arguments before the court, they changed the law, which said any minor. The state changed, basically overwrote the law in in their arguments and said, well, it's really what would be harmful to a 17-year-old. So the judge writes, so it's really not about all minors. So you're saying this is about all minors, but it doesn't protect all minors. It only protects 17-year-olds. And then he goes back and cites Quite a bit of case law, like Jacob Ellis versus Ohio, which was where Justice Potter Stewart famously said of obscenity, I know what it is when I see it, which is like just a historically vague thing to say, because we all view what might be obscene differently. I feel fairly certain my definition of obscenity is pretty much broader out than, for instance, my state senator, Jack Johnson, who sponsored the drag law ban. So it was, um, I mean, there was just, there was... The judge found nothing in there to uphold this law. To say nothing of the fact that, you know, Tennessee, like other states, already has laws about obscenity and what you can do and where kids can be and private clubs. And so there was there was absolutely no need for this law, which is Holly. Am I correct? The judge who had this finding last night, he was appointed by whom? That would be. Former President Donald Trump. Yeah, right? How about that? It's, A Trump appointed you know, judge. I mean, it's miracles happen. Well, you know, this is not the first law that the state legislature passed this last session that's been overturned on grounds of being unconstitutional by other Trump appointed lawyers. So, you know, we, we might, let me don my tinfoil hat and we might be able to get into our state attorney general. But uh, it's just like it's fascinating to me that the legislature keeps passing these laws. I know some of the legislative attorneys and they're you know very bright, normal people. I have no doubt that the legislature is get they're getting the, the information that, look, this is probably not going to hold up, but they do it anyway. Um, there's a Democratic lawmaker, John Ray Clemens from Nashville, who is um, – he's actually the Democratic House caucus leader, but he's also an attorney. And his arguments during uh, the legislative process made it into the court file because he you know, basically said, look, this is not going to hold up. It goes against freedom of speech. It does this. It does that. And so they're being told, but they just don't care. And I think part of this is because they're thinking about their next election and how they're going to keep themselves from being primaried on the right because as – 
bizarre as some of this seems to us, believe me, there are people much, much further to the right. Yeah, so this this is a theme across the country now, and the Republican Party has been captured and it's trapped, and they've gerrymandered themselves mm-hmm. into this pack of trouble where you cannot be a principled conservative. Um, and, and frankly, America needs right of center just like it needs left of center, uh, or we'll yes. all go off the tracks. But the, the, we don't Absolutely. have that anymore because that party is now a crazy party, and they, they they just are accelerating their their. Uh, I mean, you're describing a legislature where the legislators do not care about the results because they know the results are going to get tossed out in court. They know what they're doing mm-hmm. is not something you can do in America unless America becomes a very different place. You cannot pass laws that are punitively and uncon- punitive and unconstitutional. It's just not. Um, it's not something we allow in, in, in America today. They don't care. It's all sort of signaling to this angry, angry constituency. Yeah, and, you know, Edward, there, there's a pretty big difference between being a conservative. And, and I don't have a problem with conservatives. Me I either. thought I was a Republican. I thought I was, I thought I was conservative or I thought I was a Republican for a long time. And so I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is this lunatic, lunatic far right white nationalist um, anti government anti it's it, and you know there's just no and I don't see many people anywhere many Republicans willing to stand up and a case in point is I exchanged messages not too long ago with a Tennessee Republican um, who is I will just say he has a prominent role in a national Republican organization, and his family is also a longtime prominent um, Republican family in Tennessee. His father, I think it was his father, maybe it was his grandfather, but at any rate, served in the federal, Tennessee's federal delegation at one time. Okay, so we're talking about establishment Republican. And we were talking, he goes, oh, I hope somebody stands up and does something about this far right wing in Tennessee. And I said, here's a great idea. What about you? Why don't you do it? You've got a respected family name. You've got a family legacy. You were actually in a position in the Republican Party where you could do something. And, you know, and, and I like this guy. He's smart. He's nice. I remember his father slash grandfather. He was in office, but he was hemmed and hawed. And, like, I don't think he's going to do anything. And if somebody like that isn't going to stand up, has a problem, and won't stand up and do anything, then in that case, I feel like those conservatives kind of deserve to be taken apart by the right wing. I don't like it, but, you know, it's that whole thing about if not me, who? If you don't like the way that things are going, you've got to be the one to make the change. Yeah, if not me, who is important. If not now, when is important. Yep. You know, and they also, the other part of that, I think it was, uh, actually, I think it, it all comes from, um, uh, Rabbi Hillel in the first century. And the first question is, if I'm not for me, who am I for? They have to be. They have to have their sense of integrity intact. And then the heck, then you know, they have to be for somebody else. I mean, that's they they cannot keep your friend cannot keep his true sense of integrity and let this happen in his name in his party's name if he doesn't say something. No, I just I, I really you know I've got a pretty big mouth, um, and, and sometimes like this. You know, people will throw this in my face because I did run for office in 2016, um, which I'm not sure we, we've ever talked about, but I ran for the state legislature against a Republican in my hometown where my family settled in the 1790s. And he had sexually harassed or assaulted 26 women, at least 26 women. His office had been moved oh. out of the legislature. And so people say to me, like, how could you as a journalist run for office? Well, first of all, I do believe that stepping up to run for office is the highest civic calling that anybody could undertake. And secondly, I remember looking around thinking, man, I grew up here. My family settled this county. And if I'm, if so, I'm the person who has to do this. Nobody else is doing it. Somebody's got to take this guy on. Um, and I lost, which has actually turned out to be a great thing. But I just don't understand how some of these people sleep at night. I really don't. Holly, I ran for office against the governor of my own party, a sitting governor of my own party who was a crook. Um, I lost. He went to jail. <laughs> um, and I'm thrilled one, that one I did it. And one of several in my state. Yeah, we have seem to have that path pretty clear. But, um, you know, I'm, th- I'm thrilled that 
uh, gave voters a choice and so many people made it. Um, and it, uh, uh, you learn something. And then what happened to him afterwards? He got impeached by the legislature and thrown out. You know, part of that is mm-hmm. the results of, of you going out, talking to people and telling people that there's a different future they can have. They may not get it right away, but it makes it's like, um, what was it that Ruth Bader Ginsburg said about dissents? You know, it's oh. she's writing for the future. And when you run for yeah. office and you run a good campaign, you don't have to win to have made a difference right. for the future. That, that is exactly what I tell people. You can make a difference. I, I do really, really believe it's not for everybody, but I think stepping up to run for office and caring about your community, even as a journalist, like I should not not be able to care about my community and participate civically because I'm a journalist. I just don't agree with that. And it is the highest. I'm going to share with you a very short story. I don't know when you got to cut the commercial, but it was the most meaningful experience of my life running for office. And I knocked on the door one night. It was late. It was dark. It was close to the election. And um, this, I'm going to, I have to describe this, but this man opened the door. He was very big. And he was a black man, and he looked like one might think an NFL player would look like. And I described him because of what comes next. And, you know, I start with my spiel, hey, I'm Holly McCall. And he puts his hand on his chest, like over his heart, and said, I've been wanting to meet you. Please come in, come in, come in. And by the way, <laughs> listeners, don't ever go, you're not ever supposed to go into somebody's house. But I did. And uh, he pulled out a piece of direct mail I had sent that talked about my opponent's sexual crimes and it said if this were your mother or daughter wouldn't you want somebody to or your you know, somebody like your mother or daughter wouldn't you want somebody to do anything and he picked up that piece of mail and said i've been wanting to meet you ever since i got this and then he started to cry and i can hardly tell this story without tearing up myself and he said you know i was sexually abused when i was a child mm. and i told my family and nobody did anything about it they didn't believe me so i just stopped <laughs> talking about it and mm. thank you for talking about the things nobody else will. And it mm. still choked me up. It's a beautiful story. And it's a powerful story. I mean, it's a story anyway. about not just running for office, Holly. It's, an, it's a story about um, being seen and, being, and for people being able yeah. to, you know, we're, we're in a fight in our country over, uh, battleground states, but we're in a fight over what freedom means. And, and, you know, the Republicans, I don't know what it means to them anymore, but for me, it is the right of vigorous self assertion, right? That, that, that man should not have to have hid all his life. Mm-hmm. The most, the, the thing that was the most painful and most important part of his life. We're in pride month where mm-hmm. until, you mm-hmm. know, the relatively recent era, people had to hide. This yep. most important fact of their character. What you're describing is giving somebody the license to finally say who they are. And that is so powerful. Well, you know, since we're talking about this drag ban and the Pride Month, I habitually get emails from people who say, why is there a Pride Month? Why, why is there a gay Pride Month? Why is there a straight Pride Month? And then I have to, like, write two or three paragraphs, which are, <clears throat> live in my head, and I educate them. Hey, look, uh, if you want to learn more, you should read. There's a book called Secret City about um, mm-hmm. being LGBTQ in Washington's government, and I don't have it in front of me right now, so I don't have the, t- the exact title. But it's by James Kirscher, and it it is so eye opening about how people, brilliant, brilliant minds, were fired from federal government positions, like making crucial and key policy decisions. Mm-hmm. And part of it was with, with that red scare. But I have to educate people, like, hey, you couldn't even, you know, same sex couples couldn't even dance together in a bar that was or a restaurant that was specifically catering. And then I have to talk about Stonewall, and I don't mind doing that because. I'm always happy to educate people. Now, those people might then call me a groomer or tell me to go F myself, but that's certainly not the first time, you know, people said that to me. But I'm going to make people at least have to read what I've got to say. We're talking with Holly McCall. It's not very timid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Editor-in-chief of the Tennessee Lookout. Um, and uh, I, we've had a fabulous conversation so far. Hey, Holly, I want to dive into a couple things that I read about, but I don't, I don't have the background fully 
to understand. And, and mm-hmm. um, this is one of your reporters who wrote a, a terrific story, but I could use a little more background. And it was about something called the Constitutional Republicans who took over a oh, county yeah. and now want to get rid of the county's HR department. But then I read some other things about these constitutional Republicans. Like, would you tell us who they are, what they're trying to do, and what's going on? Yeah, so Sumner County. This is it's, Sumner County is one of what we call one of the donut counties that surrounds Nashville Davidson County, and it, you know, it's slightly north of Nashville, it abuts the county. It you know has become, I'd say, much more affluent in recent years, and. Like, obviously, we've seen a turn towards right-wing politics, but this is the only county I know of in the state of Tennessee that has these so-called constitutional Republicans. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating about the constitutional Republicans is that they want to change um, – I'm trying to find the exact wording for this. I've opened up – we've done a number of stories on them, actually. Um, They want to change the wording of – like some of the things in county government, oh, yeah, it includes establishing a Christian foundation for governance, and they want to make sure the terms Judeo-Christian are, are involved in a guiding document for the county commission. So we first became aware <laughs> so of the Constitution and constitutional is not the U.S. Constitution, clearly. <laughs> Well, again, we some of these folks do not understand separation of church and state, right? So, so we first became aware of them in January. It's in a bizarre case where they want to take over public property and give it to um, give it to a private organization, and it's sort it's about land that surrounds this historic property, and they think that it's going to be given over to create a greenways, which. I don't know what it is about greenways that drives people crazy, but that was the first time we heard about them. That it is kind of a tin well hat thing. Part of it is, you know, those people will use the greenways, and then they're going to like come to our yards and they're going to steal stuff. So there's that, but then there's also what else did they do? Oh, they almost got into a lawsuit with their county election commission because they decided they were not going to take an order of new voting machines. And they said, well, what happens if we just don't, uh, you know, if we don't take these voting machines? We, we didn't approve the expenditure. The last county commission did, but we didn't. So, therefore, we're not going to accept delivery of these custom voting machines. You know, and the election uh, administrator said, well, then we're going to get sued by the, <laughs> by the uh, mm-hmm. company that made the voting machines because they made them just for us. You can't, you can't refuse delivery. So there's been sort of a back and forth with the election commission. They have a beef with the fact that early voting goes on for two weeks. They say it's too long. That's actually a state law. So they can't really do anything about that, but they think they can. Um, and now there's this latest, there's this latest thing. And, you know, AB, I think it was an ABC or CBS. No, it was the Associated Press. Again, middle-aged woman. Associated Press actually did a story on this group of lawmakers um, because of the fact, I think their headline was they are against the government, but now they are the government. And yeah. so I don't, I don't even know what to make of it. And I mean, it's certainly there's things like this going on in other counties, um, but I just don't even know. Like, I don't even know what to say about this. They ran a campaign last year, so they took there were 17 seats up for election. They won 14 of them, and you know, one of the great things about America's government is that anybody can run for office without any experience or knowledge. You can run, and I think that's sort of the citizen-led government thing. That's great. On the other hand, sometimes you get real buffoons who have no clue about the job they are supposed to do and the legalities of what it entails. And that seems to be, I'm not exactly calling these people buffoons, but I will say that they don't seem to have real knowledge of the role that they are supposed to play. And that is troublesome. Yeah, governing is hard work. Doing it well is hard work. And, you know, we can use our politics. And in states all over the country, people are using them to make life better for the people who live in those states. I would argue that the 117th Congress passed laws that make the country better. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, right now, whether it's, you know, your state legislatures who are just like want to use their chance in office to uh, pass laws that 
can never really be enacted because they're unconstitutional, just because they want to complain about American society. They don't like the country they ended up living in because it's not the country they imagined somehow. Um, that doesn't do anybody any good. I mean, and, and, and it allows for such sway. I mean, I, I read a story again about, in your state, boy, this reminded me of mine, but you have a pris- private operator of prisons who, by all accounts, is doing a really terrible job, right? Mm-hmm. But he's going to get a new mm-hmm. contract because I maybe because there are campaign contributions involved, but probably just because the hard working of government isn't a priority when politicians can get people excited about, I don't know, maybe there's three transgender girls who want to play high school sports in your state. Yeah, I mean, and this this company, uh, Core Civic, it used to be called Corrections Corporation of America. They that company does donate a lot of money to mm-hmm. Republicans in the state. But I don't think you know. I know there are readers who will email me and say, "Oh, it's about the donations." I don't even think it's that direct. Uh, I mean, I think that certainly plays a role, but I don't think it's quid, that 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 direct quid pro quo. Um, I think that we have some lawmakers who really believe that private prisons are probably the way to go. Tennessee has a history of um, convict leasing back in the day. The state used to Mm -hmm. lease convicts to private coal mines until they figured out they could make more money if they just put our inmates to work for the state. Um, So Mm -hmm. we've got a long history of that kind of privatization of people who've been convicted of crimes. Um, But, yeah, I mean, this, this company has paid the state $17 $17 million in fines. And so they just got a new contract. And I'm like, it's kind of a wash. We're just trading money back and forth. The state's trading money back and forth with this uh, private prison contract. Do they pay $17 million in fines? We kick up a new multi-billion dollar contract. It's a wash. And, yeah. you know, there are just multiple. We get blown up weekly with people who write in. And we just don't have the bandwidth to, you know, explore everything and investigate with people who – Somebody's been, a relative has been killed, Hmm. I mean, multiple deaths in these prisons, you know, critically injured, uh, stabbed, and we we, we don't have the bandwidth to investigate. And it's breaking my heart because no matter what the crime is, whether somebody did commit it and they are convicted, you know, there's that cruel and unusual punishment statute in the Constitution as well. And just because you're in prison, you should not be killed by another inmate. Or a guard. Well, I mean, again, it just goes to, are they serious about governing or not? You know, about doing the job with the taxpayer's money for the benefit of the people in the state. And it just seems like, you know, let's let's make some political noise so we can keep the job. But when we have it, let's not bother trying to make the state better for everybody who lives here. I mean, I you know, we talked after the horrendous school shooting that you had. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I guess before I ask about the status of gun laws since then, how's the healing going? Um, I, you know, it's rough. Yeah. It's rough. Um, Nashville is still a small enough city it, that, you know, folks are so interwoven. And, you know, I found out I've got two friends. I didn't realize this. But shooting, two of my friends have kids that go there. Um. Mm. And, you know, I've got a friend who's a teacher there who told me there's a little boy in his class who wets his pants in class because he's mm. afraid that if he leaves to go to the bathroom, he might get shot. Mm. And, you know, parents are struggling. And even those who don't have a child in the school or maybe don't have a connection, like they talk about their kids now know about this. You can't hide this stuff, you know, in today's oh. media world, 24-7. Kids know about it. They all have this training. Um, you know, they're taught. I think now they're taught to like run out of the school and run as far away from po- as possible. A uh, woman was telling me her child goes to a Montessori school, and um, the teachers there have axe handles or baseball bats. So if a shooter breaks out glass in the door to get in, they are supposed to club uh, the shooter over the head. And so, and so teachers are leaving the school. Who wants that? So, it, yeah, it's tough, and it's it's complicated and exacerbated by the fact that most of our lawmakers just don't seem that concerned. You know, you expect yeah, I, I, you expect some empathy, and there just isn't any. I mean, I, you didn't pass. I mean, even your governor, who, who is not you know 
working overtime on issues like this, I think tried some at least Band-Aid about not keeping guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. But that's not going to pass, is it? Oh, no. Um, there was a special, you know, he called for a special <clears throat> legislative session in August. Um, you know, there's some cynicism about the timing of that. That's mm-hmm. after school starts. Does it mean that teachers and, you know, students will be able to leave school to come protest like they did at the end of the legislative session? But both the Speaker of the House, who's got plenty of his own issues, and the um, Lieutenant Governor have said, well, it's not going to pass. We're just not going to do it. Like the Speaker of the House has flat said anything that even remotely smells like a red flag law is not going to pass. And so, like, what happens in August? Like, the the governor cannot uncall the special session because then he completely loses face. So there's going to be a special session. I do think there are going to be a lot of protesters there. And what action is going to be taken? And on top of that, once they're there, the lawmakers, can they can bring other stuff up. So what other sort of tomfooler did they bring up? I mean, I just like I think it's going to be a fairly useless legislative session. Perhaps Mm -hmm. more harmful legislation will come out of it. And and, you know, I I I am. I just want to say, like, I I criticize Democrats too when they need to be criticized. And I'll often hear people say, "Well, you know, the Democrats were in charge for a long time." I said, "Yes, they were, and they were very stupid. They did a lot of very stupid things. Um, There was a lot of corruption. There were two major." Of federal corruption scandals. In one, the Secretary of State and the House Democratic Majority Leader both committed suicide. Um, but, you know, the corruption was kind of personal. It was about getting money and graft. I don't remember, I don't remember this, I don't remember the Democratic led legislations being as malicious. I don't remember the malicious legislation. Yes, they gerrymandered. Do I agree with that? I do not. It doesn't make it right that Republicans are doing it now. But I don't remember the level of malicious legislation that was coming out of the Democratic-led legislatures. Yeah. Uh, Yep. We have in a strange time. Look, let's turn to local journalism in the time we have left because, you know, I mean – Gannett was, for a time, I think the biggest, one of the biggest news organizations out there, and certainly the one that did the most to deliver local news coverage all over America. And it's, you know, it's now shrinking away. It's staffers and reporters are protesting cuts, none of which is going to bring those news jobs back. Legacy print media is going away, which makes efforts like yours so much more important. So tell everybody, because I know you began to talk about this, a little bit about the lookout, a little bit about the organization that you're part of and why local news, you know, why it matters so much and even how it might help us, you know, deal with the craziness of a new presidential election cycle. Well, Edwin, you know, thank you for asking about that. This is such a lob for me because I talk about it all the time. You know, I think... Since these newsrooms have been just decimated over the last 20 years, um, what folks tend to – the news people tend to see is Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, depending on your leanings. Um, And so it's it's very – I think it's very easy for people to focus on this 24-7 national news coverage and what is Donald Trump doing and what is Ron DeSantis doing and, you know, did Joe Biden trip at the Air Force Academy. And you know what? We can't – honestly make too much difference with that. No average citizen can make much of a difference. Where we can have an impact and where the impact is most felt on us is through state and local government. And there's just not there are very few outlets that cover that. And I think that the nonprofit news model that we have is going to be the way of the future. So Tennessee Lookout, we launched just over three years ago. We were in our fourth year. Um, but we are part of the state's newsroom network. And I think we are up to thirty five outlets now. Uh, When they finish launching outlets, we will have 40 outlets. We also have relationships with some very highly respected uh, nonprofit news outlets like, um, oh, gosh, Texas. I can't believe I'm doing this. Is it the Tribune? Tribune. The Tribune. Yeah. The Independent. Yeah. There is the Texas Tribune. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's like the granddaddy of news, um, you know, independent news outlets, mm-hmm, nonprofit. Mm-hmm. There's Mississippi Today. And so we're, we'll end up having a presence in 50 states. And I think it's vital because 
One of the things that we do is, in addition to having two full-time Capitol Hill reporters, uh, which oftentimes people will say, I had no idea this was going on, and, and you wouldn't even reading most of the Gannett outlets. Gannett now has two reporters for, for, to cover the state for the entire state of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So what they write here in Nashville um, goes into the Memphis papers, the Knoxville paper. And look, I know both of the reporters. They are great. Um, they are drinking from a fire hose. But – you know, the state needs more than two reporters. So we've got our two reporters up there full time. We've got a third reporter who doesn't focus necessarily on the legislature, but we'll look at these state departments and corruption and oversight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best thing we do that other states' newsrooms outlets do is we share our content free. So what that means for us is there are more than two dozen um, weekly news outlets in rural parts of Tennessee that carry our content. They don't carry all of it, but they carry some of it because otherwise the only thing they are hearing from the state capitol is the press release slash newsletter that their local state senator or state representative sends. And, you know, some some of these people, like I plan to get in my car this week, this uh, summer and do an old-fashioned road show, drive around the state, talk to editors, talk to publishers, and show them how they, they can use our content. I'm probably going to start doing, like, brief newsletters when I know what folks are interested in. And w- what is fascinating to me is I was at a conference a few weeks ago, and I met the publisher of the Polk County News. Polk mm-hmm. County is a very small rural county to East Tennessee, and he said, I publish your columns. And my reporters are straight down the middle. I, I don't know anything about their politics. But there's certainly no secret about mine. And I said, you know, I, I know that. I, I'm fascinated that, that you run my columns because they're pretty liberal. And he said, yeah, they are, and I never get uglier emails from people than when I run your columns. <laughs> he goes, you know, I don't agree with them all either, but I do think it's important that people see opinions that are different from their own. And so I'm telling you, like, that's what that is one of the best things anybody has said to me in 2023. Like, I can't tell you how much I love that. Holly, I, I think it's so important for all the reasons that you have described for sharing viewpoints, for for letting people know what's going on in their capitals, where all kinds of important decisions about who we are being made. But I think local news has another value that that is also important. It, look, if, if I write... That, you know, Holly opened a restaurant on Commercial Street. People can go see it with their own eyes. It's reality yep. confirming, right? If, yeah. if you, if you listen to the national news about something you can never see really about, mm-hmm. I don't know what happened between, uh, uh, nominee to the Supreme Court and a, and a friend of his who's now a college professor in a bedroom 30 years ago that may or may not have been you know, completely abusive. Nobody's going to mm-hmm. really be, you, know, you can't know. It doesn't, it, it doesn't right. confirm reality. It confirms bias and right. local journalism, because people see it with their own eyes, because it affects them so really clearly. Um, it, it builds a sense of reality and boy, do we need that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is an excellent point. You know, one of the things that is sort of like, one of these sort of overarching stories that circulates in the universe is that Americans lack a sense of community. People are on social media, you know, Twitter. I love Twitter. I tell people my ho- that's one of my ho- it's one of my few hobbies. But it's also it's not exactly reality. You can put whatever you want up there on Twitter, right? But I think mm-hmm. that I love nothing better. Like I. You know, I started work, I started writing a column called As Teens Tell It for my local newspaper when I was 15 years old. And that sort of like gave me ideas about what local journalism can do because people want to see that people wanted to see their kids names in the paper. People love local sports coverage. It's one of the yep. things journalism creates community, aids and sustains community, and I'm really really passionate about that. And I wish I could talk to more people about it because I think many Americans have gotten cynical about journalism, and I understand that. But that's why, like, I, you said it better than I could. That is why local journalism is so important. Well, let's leave it there because we're out of time. But, Holly, as always, it's a great pleasure to catch up with you. That went so fast. Edwin, sometime you should call me when you were off the air, and we can just talk. And thank you. Uh, you for know what? Letting I'm going to take you up on that. Excellent. Thank you for letting me run my mouth to your listeners. Take care, Holly. Bye. 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 Edwin. We're going to break. We're going to take a break for the news. And when we come back, we are going to talk law. 
You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisentraff on WCPT 820. 